Howdy folks, I got another fun Mexican liqueur to show you. Uh, it's red, it's bitter, it's got bugs in it. I got a cocktail we can try out. Let's go. Now, I've been sitting on this one for a little while. Uh, I've been having trouble finding a cocktail that it works well in. Uh, I might have figured it out here recently. It's called Granada Valet. By the way, I'm pronouncing this kind of wrong, I think. This is a product from Mexico. Uh, a guy from France came to Mexico and started this uh, distillery that's making uh, various liqueurs. They make a Fernet and an Angostura-based one, and it's called uh, Valle. That guy's name is Valle. So two L's in Spanish is a Y and an E-T in French is an A sound. His name is Valle, but I, I, I can't say it. I just, I just, it doesn't fit in my brain that way. It's my dumb American brain. So I'm just going to call it Granada Valette. Most people around here call it Valette, even though that's probably not correct. Anyway, what is it? It is a pomegranate based bitter red aperitif, sort of along the lines of Campari but it's a little bit more bitter than Campari and a little bit higher proof. Auntie Susan and I did a live stream about bitter red aperitifs uh, probably about a year ago, uh, including this Granada Valette. If you've got 47 minutes to kill, you could go watch that and learn a lot about um, bitter red aperitifs. But I'm gonna pull out a little uh, section of that to show you because one of the interesting things about uh, Granada Valette is that it's uh, colored with cochineal. Cochineal is a little scale insect that lives on nopalis plants. Uh, it was a very important crop in Mexico, and when uh, Campari was invented, they were using it to color the Campari. But let me, I'm gonna let Auntie Susan tell you about this because she's much more um, articulate than me. Why is Campari red? Or rather, how? What makes it red? Originally, Campari was colored by cochineal insects. Why would someone use an insect to color a food? Uh, upon further investigation, I have learned that in fact, scale insects were among the most powerful and most sought after dyes uh, used around the world for millennia. Uh, medieval Europe had access to only a few different red dye sources. One of them was madder, which is a plant, but it produces an inconsistent dye that's really more orangey than red. You could get a brilliant vermilion red out of these scale insects. Scale insects are little insects about the size of a lentil that are parasitic on plants, and when dried and ground, produce a powder that has a high enough concentration of an acid that when mixed with water uh, produces a red dye. Interestingly, kermes, uh, the word kermes actually means little worm and gives us the word carmen, which refers to the red color that is produced by these dyes. Another word with a similar meaning, vermilion, also means little worm and for the same reason. So some of the words we have for red actually are words that mean little worm, and worm meaning insect. So medieval Europe, it had these two sources of red. It had matter, which was kind of crappy and muddy looking, and it had these scale insects, which were very rare and produced a brilliant red, but had to be used in great quantity in order to make anything very red. As a result, they were extremely expensive and used only infrequently and only for the very wealthy, which is why red cloth was associated with nobility. Meanwhile, in Mexico, in Oaxaca, for millennia, indigenous people had been domesticating cochineal, another scale insect that is parasitic on the prickly pear, the nopala. This insect, also dried and ground to a powder, produces a much more powerful dye, something like 26 more times powerful than oak kermes or Armenian red. When Cortez and the Spanish invaded Mexico and sought to colonize and exploit it, they discovered after a few decades that one of the most valuable exports available to them was in fact cochineal. This was a tribute good that had been in place as a tribute good prior to their arrival, and they started to send it back to Spain with great results. It was a very valuable export, and they closely guarded what it was and where it came from. Many people tried to uh, get into the Spanish colonies to steal some of it and cultivate it on their own, and they pretty much failed for many centuries, and the Spanish had basically a monopoly on the color red in Europe for a long time. They increased exports as fast as they could. Over time, Guatemala became a producer, Peru became a producer, 
and eventually someone succeeded in getting it cultivated in the Canary Islands. This was in the 19th century. So by the mid-1800s, if you wanted to make something red, you were probably doing it with cochineal, including Campari. So when Campari came about in the 1860s, cochineal was the obvious thing to use to color it red. Why'd they decide to color it red? I don't know. To all the little scale insects of the world and their brilliant red dye, I say thank you. Anyway, let's try this stuff. It is very bright red, just maybe slightly orange. It's got a very vegetal, dusty kind of aroma. It's, it's like, yeah, it's like sandy. Does that make sense? It smells sandy. Let's try it. It is bitter. It's very bitter. It's very dry. Mm -hmm. Very drying of the palate. Uh, that's sort of what you expect, but this is pretty intense and it's got this sort of mineral lingering dusty dry bitterness that is still lingering on my palate right now and that's why this has been sort of hard for me to use in cocktails this sort of very very dry um dry bitterness uh, really overwhelms in a lot of drinks and lingers and gives you sort of a weird aftertaste in a way sort of the way malort does you sort of have to do a little bit of battle, a little mitigation to um, get this to work in a drink. But I had an idea and I think we're gonna see if it'll work. I'm gonna give you a little bit of a step-by-step because -step, this drink in my mind and through trying it a few times has gone through some changes. My first thought was if I have a very bitter thing, I should try and make a Toronto style cocktail. Now a Toronto, if you're not aware, is basically an old fashioned, a rye old fashioned, uh, with fernet in it to you know flavor it up a little bit. Toronto, of course, a delicious drink and you know a pretty easy format to riff upon. Uh, I used that format when I made a, a Gamel Dansk video. You should check that out. Uh, Gamel Dansk is a Danish, very very bitter liqueur, and I was able to make an Aquavit Toronto style drink uh, called the Dansk Dansk Revolution. Go, go watch that video. Anyway, I tried it with just Blanco tequila, uh, old fashioned with Granada Valet. It wasn't quite working. For one thing, I wanted to use uh, an aged tequila, which I don't actually have on hand. So what I did was a little hack. I did tequila and I put a little rye in it just to give me some of those woody notes. And that seemed to work pretty well. But then it was a little bit too bitter, a little bit too much. So I decided to try uh, lengthening it out and moving this drink into more of like a Negroni direction. I got some burr. Uh, if you don't know what burr is, pronounced beer maybe? I always call it burr, but it's supposed to be pronounced beer because it's French. It's a French aromatized wine that's bittered with uh, chinchona bark. Uh, I have a video on that as well. You should go, if you want to learn about that, you should go check out that video. But So I added some beer to try and uh, round out the drink, add a little sweetness, um, try and work with this very bitter ingredient. If you don't have beer and you want to try something like this, a good substitute might be ruby port or Dubonnet. I don't love Dubonnet, but you could maybe you love it. In the last version, I was using simple syrup to sweeten it, but I decided to switch to grenadine uh, to try and lean into some more of those fruity notes. I also decided to put in a dash of lime bitters. Now, this drink doesn't need any more bitterness, but a little bit of fruitiness, a little bit of lime flavor. I thought that would add a little something, so we're gonna do that. Okay, so I don't know how this is gonna turn out, but let's try it.
look at that ice. Yes, sir. Uh, now I was doing an orange, um, an orange twist over the top, but uh, I decided to omit it. I think it was maybe interfering. It's got a very tequila smell. I mean, I cut it back. I had a half an ounce of mm -hmm. Granada Valette in there originally. I cut that back to a, a quarter. The okay. bottle has this one of those plastic, uh, not stoppers, but one of those plastic flow regulator things in it, which are really weird to me. Like, you have to sort of get them going, and they won't they won't pour, and then it all pours out at once. I don't love it, but they're kind of hard to get rid of. Anyway, it was sort of a fat quarter ounce of Granada Violet that I put in there. I think that's pretty good. It's not too bitter. When I had made this earlier, um, it had it was a little bit kind of a, a wallop of bitterness at the end. Let me try this again. I think a little bit more of the beer and the grenadine mm. made a, a pretty big difference. I think that's pretty good. It's a little weird, uh, a little bit bitter, uh, but not as bitter as the original version. Now, I think there's a little bit of a lesson to be learned here, and that is that different people have different palates. When I made this drink originally last week, I thought it was pretty good. I tried it out on my bosses, Cody and Brett, and they were like, mm, I don't know, like it was kind of weird, kind of bitter, but you know, everybody has a different palate. I usually like slightly sweeter, slightly weirder things. This is definitely in the weird category. And just because you love it doesn't mean it will be widely popular or fit the menu at a fancy cocktail bar. That's okay, you drink what you like. Anyway, there's no rules at your house. You can drink whatever you want. If you've got something that you think I might like, put it down in the comments. Uh, maybe I'll try it at some point. Uh, in the meantime, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.